Yeah, as long as her mother's Jewish. And Mary was a Jew and God was not. So, you know, <laughs> he's still Jewish. I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Nine Cents. Nine Cents is a satanic perspective of our modern world, and I is your host, Adam Campbell, being joined by the amazing Aden Arden. How are you, my man? I'm doing so wonderful. (laughs) 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 I'm so terribly happy that that you're doing so well. It it fills me with a sense of of not only joy, but but fulfillment, more than your, your two and a quarter inches could ever compare. I've ne- I haven't felt this good since my brisk. It was fantastic. <laughs> I I was lucky enough to have the rabbi who sucked on your bloody stump. It, it was a wonderful experience as a child. That's right. It's what prevented me from acting on my homosexuality. <laughs> so Every fun. time I try to put my little bloody stump near someone, <laughs> I think of this old crazed Jew. It's terrible. It is April 20th, people, <laughs> and despite the uh, horrible Jewish accents, yeah, Jewish accents, uh, it's still going to be a fantastic show. It is uh, April 20th, I don't know if I already said that. Um, anyway, we've got a fantastic show for you. So, uh, he is risen, Aden. Do you feel better? Well, I got a blowjob this morning, so I feel great. <laughs> Dude, you are one up in me all day long, god damn it. Why you didn't you didn't get one? It's it's Hitler's birthday and it's Easter. Everybody should get a blowjob. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm gonna have to implement that tradition pronto. <laughs> I I am fully behind it. All right. So at the beginning, <laughs> at the top of the show, uh, after the little hijinks there, you heard a custom intro from one of the listeners. Thank you very much for that. If you would like to give us your intro. Uh, phone 801-899-6168. It is a Google Voice account, so you will not get anyone answering the phone for you. And you can leave us your own, I would like, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. We appreciate all of those who have done it, and if you're considering, do it. Hitler would be disappointed if you didn't. Just and saying. Got, you, and you don't want to disappoint Hitler. No. I no, just, of course not. You go to hell, and you're not on Hitler's good side? I mean, imagine the shit that you're going to be facing. Just shit, I'm, I'm scared about the pineapples. <laughs> I'm so happy you got that. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> scared. <laughs> okay, so a couple things before we start the show. First of all, actually, let, let's go over the show really quick. So we're going to start off with the Nine Cents Letters, still working through some of the 18th Key stuff. Uh we're going to be addressing um, mental illness, I suppose. In Agent Provocateur, Darren does not disappoint. In episode 11, just some shit. And we're closing it out, of course, at N. Arden is in the his house with militant eroticism, episode 11. And uh, what are you calling this thing? Plato's fetishes. Mm. It's what they wanted, so I gave it to them. I wanted <laughs> you know, do it raw, but hey, they wanted Plato's fetishes. <laughs> hey, you're a man of the people. What, Don't what you can ever you do? say that to me again. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> All right. So before we start the show, uh, obviously it's Easter. I give a fuck. Uh, 420. I give less of a fuck. Here's the thing. It, it always sort of. I don't. I don't get it. Like you either get like huge in like like marijuana enthusiasts which take 420 to the fucking crazy mile, or you get those who are wildly against it in all of its forms. I see a couple of these floating around in our circles there, Dan, who are, are so against it that they just go out of their way to make statements about it. And I'm sitting here like, I, what? I don't care. I have a life. Why would I care? Like, I, if there's potheads wanting to smoke, and if there's people against it, why the fuck does that bother me? Like, I, I just don't, I don't understand the, the excitement about it. I mean, I, I don't I don't ever get it. I called my mom 
And I'm like, nah, it's 420. And she goes, yeah, I'm baked out of my mind. I'm like, oh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> but she, but she has a prescription, so it's legal. But <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't understand. Um, people who are obsessed with this, with, with 420. Yeah, that's weird. It, it has to be because of the, the legality issue surrounding it. It has to be because if you've ah. ever smoked weed, I, I don't think it's that great of a thing. It's I, I really genuinely prefer some of my other endeavors like beer and wine. <laughs> I, I don't I don't get the mass appeal. Um, sure, yeah, the, the legal thing is probably what's making it an even more big hoopla, but... Yeah, it's got yeah, laws I just, of forbidden, I man. just don't get it. People seem almost self, uh, self-righteous self about it on both sides of the table. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 420. Sure. I'm, I'm going to get high as a former rebellion. No, no, no. All pot is bad. I'm going to put a big poster on my ass and wave my butt in the air. <laughs> Smell my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Which would actually be kind of interesting to see if you're just walking down the street. That guy really is against fucking marijuana. <laughs> or he has an awesome sense of humor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and no time. <laughs> no no need to, to do anything for himself. All right. Um, so last night I was watching Raging Bull. And just sort of out of the blue, I know. Uh, this is sort of our... Okay, so pretty much for every holiday, because I have kids. I have two kids. Um, for every holiday, there, there's no real like religious significance at all for it. My kids think more of the Easter Bunny in Easter than they do of anything else because they've never, as far as I know, been told anything about the other crazy religious side of it. Though you could argue that a bunny who lays eggs is just as crazy. Um, and so we've always focused on the the sort of bunny aspect of it. And so my wife was like insistent on staying up till the wee hours of the morning, almost in like a Christmas mode. To hide fucking eggs. And I don't... I don't fucking get it. And so I'm sitting here watching Raging Bull with a raging heart on because she wore this really great skirt yesterday, the little dress thing, and it just had me going all day. And if you have kids, <laughs> then you can't always exercise the demons when you want to, so you have to kind of wait for opportune moments. And that opportune moment was fucking hindered by Easter, of all goddamn things. And so I'm sitting here trying to watch De Niro act in this really i think probably scorsese's worst film ever and enjoying trying to enjoy it while trying not to think about pussy it was the hardest thing i had ever done it was horrible well, so you that know, was you... my my evening did you do anything fun for easter eve <laughs> uh i guess um it, this couple that i hang out with it was the older one's birthday he turned 34 which is absolutely amazing because he doesn't look or act 34. Um, <laughs> but uh, so his boyfriend called me and said, oh, my God, I totally forgot to tell you. It's Mouse's birthday. Um, come over. And I was hanging out with my buddy, Michael. And uh, they I, I texted them for directions because when we hang out, they usually come over here and stay the night. And I couldn't remember how to get there. I just knew it was like 10 minutes away from me walking. So they never got back to me, so I went out to the bar, and then they texted me at 1 o'clock in the morning, like, shit, man, we were wondering where you were. So I went over there, and we just partied all night, and then I, 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 we all had sex, and then I came home around 7.30 in the morning. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. And I was drunk off my ass, so, you know, I made some pizza, chugged a bunch of water, and then went to, and passed out. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. I went there, I had to catch up with all the people who are already trashed. I'm like, all right, somebody passed me a shot. <laughs> I'm due. Give me a few. Nice. Yeah, yeah that's, I, that's about it. But you know what you should have done? Have you ever heard of the the egg, the egg vibrator? No. Oh, okay. It's like it looks like an egg. Oh, I wish we were video chatting right now because I'm making the best hand gestures in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's this little egg, and it has a remote to it, no wire, and you can slip it inside your your wife. And it has settings, and you can press the button. It will just start vibrating Ooh, against nice. her against her clit. It's like you want a fucking Easter egg hunt. Here we go, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny because I I tend to surf a lot of porn <laughs> just because no. I'm whenever I'm bored. I'm just like I have a phone right here. Why am I not looking at porn? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> so yeah, last night during Raging Bull, I was you know, searching some crazy uh, holiday-centric 
stuff. And you get a lot of the weird, like, people dressing up as bunny type weird shit. But I saw this one that was really strange where a woman actually took two eggs, stuck them inside of her, squeezed the first one out, and couldn't get the second one out. And she was pissing all over the kitchen trying to push the second egg out. And it was the most amazing thing because it was so comedic. Like, the best porn, in my opinion, is is unintentionally funny. And this was just fantastic. Like, I was, I wanted to share it with everyone, but that would have meant my wife and my daughter and my son, and that would have been awkward. And so I just sort of kept it to myself. <laughs> it was really yep. weird. Wait till they're 17, because then you'll be, like, the crazy... <laughs> The crazy dad, which, you know, would yeah. be fitting for you. <laughs> <laughs> True debt. All right, people, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Valperius Noct. It is coming up, and we have, as is usual per Nine Cents, a very special Valperius Noct episode. So, uh, that is why Aden is here this week and not next week. I'm blocking out the entire week for a very special interview. And if you pay attention to the Nine Cents Facebook page, you probably already know who it is. But, for those of you who don't, uh, I'm not going to tell you. You're just going to have to wait. But I yeah, will say yeah. this. It was the most challenging interview that I have conducted to date. Because there's this weird... I, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I never thought about it before I started interviewing individuals. So I don't know if you have thought about this. But there's... There's a desire to have a interesting and an interesting discussion. And so you want to bring up topics that are either thought provoking or in some way controversial. But as an interviewer, when you're sort of bounced back with questions about your question, there's this there's this assumption that you should be able to defend your question because you're fucking asking it after all. But you don't want to defend the question because you weren't trying to make any statements or anything. And then obviously I'm getting off into weird territory here that you're not going to fully follow until you actually listen to the episode. But I found myself at a moment where I felt like I should be defending a question, or I should say plural, questions that I didn't want to defend because I wasn't trying to make a statement. And it got to a point where I was being yelled at. <laughs> like, I don't know if it was to me or in general at me but either way wildly uncomfortable and like i found myself in a position that i really truly did not want to be in and and you're gonna pick up on it you'll know exactly what i'm talking about when you listen to the show tomorrow or next week but i i I recommend everyone check out this episode it is truly fantastic because i think traditionally i have a pretty good sense of control throughout most of the interviews this puts that on its head, and and for that alone, it's interesting. But then the subject is is uh, I, I, I truly love the subject, and and they have some amazing perspectives about things. So I I hope you're gonna love it as much as I do after having put it together and enjoy it for what it is and for the awkwardness that I am placed enduring. Are you interviewing? No, I'm I'm gonna. I call someone else Reb Tease, but I think now I'm going to call you Reb Tease because <laughs> you're just being an asshole right now. <laughs> but <laughs> from that description, this is, ugh, someone should slap me for saying this. I really hope you're interviewing uh, what's his name with the statue and all that shit. Because <laughs> that'd be hilarious. The Oklahoma, what's that organization? Oh my gosh! Because <laughs> that would be hilarious. Oh my gosh! I gotta tell you, I've actually run into a number of people who, um, you know, quote unquote, claim to be Satanists, fans of the Church of Satan, that actually genuinely like what they're doing. And I know it's it's sort of against the popular. If you're a member of the Church of Satan, it's against the popular uh, perception of of what they're doing, but. Yeah, I, I'm stunned. There's so many people who really, truly back that that thing, that Oklahoma thing. It's I, it's wild. I, I but no, understand. it's not them. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why some people like it. I like um, I like public pranks and things like that. But like, I remember what was it? It was the protesting in Florida saying, you know, let's pray to Satan in schools. Yeah. And when everybody thought that was a gag, I'm like, what? No, that's hilarious. 
that is absolutely hilarious. I love it. And then when they start to get more serious with the statue, I'm like, all right, now you're taking the joke too far. So I can see why some people are like, no, that's that's great. That's great what they're doing. I can understand. I disagree, but I can understand. Um, yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's still funny. And it, it's always weird because on one hand, you want to be on the same – you want to have that sort of blanket acceptance that everyone else has just as a human being, you know, there's this need to want to fit in, but then there's this also recognition. Uh, and I don't really want to get into this too much because this was not meant to be a, a conversation for this episode, but there, there's this understanding that it is not only our uh, outcast perception that I think is a major attractiveness uh, to to a significant portion of us, but also the fact that if everything's okay, then nothing's okay. Like if everything's accepted, then everything is just bland and stale, and there's no excitement. Like there there's some 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 genuine stowing away the American aspect of it of religion not being involved at all uh, in in politics, which is really at the core of this issue. Yes. There's just that 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 sense of well, you know, it's it's fun, and we're going to be out there too, and you know, what's wrong with that? Except that Rome ended for a reason, and it wasn't all that great. I, I think the slaves would attest to it, <laughs> as would the poor people. So why would we want to do it again? Like we have history as a guide, why not use it as reference? Uh, that's just how I take it, and that's what I tell to all the people who are are truly you know behind movements or groups or ideas just general concepts like this is that this has been done before this is not new and it didn't work out well it's never worked yeah so why yeah. why do it again huh. yeah because we're human yeah, and we well, um, it, you know it was fun the first time why not do it again so. <laughs> <laughs> i would have loved to uh be a fly on the wall in some of those orgies <laughs> those roman orgies Oh, you should visit me more often. <laughs> I will rebuild Rome with dildo. <laughs> <laughs> Walls made of dildo. <laughs> nice. Holly, you're right. my penis forever. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's a couple other things I was going to go over, but uh, we were kind of uh, chatting long enough. I do want to mention that Aaron... Um, Jesse and I are going to do another three-way episode. I, I got a lot of uh, favor toward the first one. We're going to do it again, and this one's going to be centered around the Satanic Witch, or for you old-timers, the Complete Witch. So um, look forward to that, and I think it's going to be like two or three weeks. Uh, but it's it's being put together, and we're going to do that. And we're going to have to do something with just the boys at some point. And then... You're going to have to, because it seems, especially on Letters to the Devil... All the men ask about the satanic witch. So like, yeah. I don't know why, but like walk around with your rock, rock, uh, walk around with your flying on done. You'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> People will be stealing glances. All right. Well, on that note, let's go ahead and dive into nine cents letters. Let's do it. Though I am an active member, I do not speak for the Church of Saint. What type of mental illness would make one not compatible with joining the Church of Satan? This could make for an interesting episode. And that it will. <laughs> <laughs> Indeedly do, neighbor. All right, so this is a question sent in by uh, 18th Key. And I, I got to say, I... I was going to pass this one over, but there's so much potential in this mm -hmm. that I think is ripe for discussion. And Aden, you being the uh, individual you are, your love of philosophy, your love of sexuality, though I'm not sure that has that much to do with this question, but the philosophy side certainly does, I thought would be an interesting discussion between the two of us. Um, so for the sake of the listeners, let's give them what they want. Do you think... Mental illness would be a barrier to joining the Church of Satan, in your opinion. Uh, well, I need to make it a little bit more vague. A mental illness is generally a barrier to living life, period. So, <laughs> <laughs> I pulled out my DSM for this. I'm like, oh, let me go through it. <laughs> let me go through them. 
And I once made the joke that in order to be a Satanist, you have to be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. But <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know. Um, maybe some of them. Uh, then again, what's considered a, a mental disorder now is just kind of like nicotine withdrawal is considered a mental disorder. Insane. Yeah. Completely yeah. insane, in my opinion. Now, I've gone through nicotine withdrawal several times. And, yeah, it made me crazy for a little bit, but I wouldn't call that a mental disorder. <laughs> yeah, and, and I don't think, I hope, that that's not the type of illness that this individual was speaking to. So it is a really good question. And, I, you know, one thing that defines, okay, and this is my opinion here, one thing that defines a Satanist is an awareness about oneself. And if you are in completely unable to have to be self-aware because of a mental illness, I think by that fact alone, you cannot be a Satanist. It is, you may have been born a Satanist, but your mind is not allowing you to exercise that expression or that, th those thoughts, those abilities. So I, I would say that for sure, if, if it's severe enough, then there are mental illnesses that would absolutely prevent you from being able to be a Satanist and thereby, hopefully, um, be a member of the Church of Satan. Well, the, the only excluding all the mental disorders that are a part of dependency, so nicotine, drugs, anorexia, bulimia, things like that, something that is more like a personality disorder, like um, bipolar uh, yeah narcissism uh, schizophrenia I, no schizophrenia well no no i wouldn't exclude schizophrenia i think you could be a member of the cos and be schizophrenic because schizophrenia is treatable as long as you take your medication the problem uh, with schizophrenics is after a while because it's a build-up drug like antidepressants yeah um after a while you think you're okay like bipolars but then again, bipolars generally go off their medication because they're sick of feeling normal. Because can, can you that, imagine? Can you imagine? That's the same with bipolar, right? You could just take your medication and and be even for a while. Yeah. Problem is, is being even, having a normal reaction to things, is so wildly different than the way you um, naturally, quote unquote, react to things. You go from so high to so low, and life is just one big fucking roller coaster. Um, can you imagine being like incredibly happy, like the happiest person in the world, and then someone wanting to take that away from you? Where you don't need to sleep for days and you're brilliant and you can they they said Beethoven was uh was bipolar because he would go through months of this locking himself in his room and being incredibly depressed and raging, and then he'd be up for days writing brilliant symphonies. Can you imagine taking that away from someone? It I mean, that that would be fucking horrible for that individual, yeah. It would, you're taking away their fun. Um, so anyway, as long as you, all right, this is the disorder I have. These are the treatments, and they work as long as I stick to them. Uh, you're aware of yourself. Then I don't see a problem. The only person, because I'm going to restrict this to personality disorders because they're treatable but not curable. Mm -hmm. You can't cure a personality. That just doesn't happen, is um, antisocial or a sociopathy. That's the only one that I'm like, no, nah, no, no, no. You, they're, they're basically born without a conscience. They could not be a Satanist. <laughs> so that's interesting. So, so having a conscience in, and I'm sort of just pushing forward the discussion on this question, having a conscience is necessary to being a healthy Satanist. Do you think? Uh, that sounds like a trick question, but yes, just because I hear so many of us joke, Morality, conscience. <laughs> well, uh, right. And, and so whenever, and, and, and maybe let's lay this groundwork, is that anytime I'm talking about Satanism, I'm very much wrapping it around the frame of an individual and not as a collective understanding. And so as long as the core philosophy is maintained, then you are a Satanist. Once you step outside of that, you know, any other flavors that, you know, in, any, any perceptions you have, social, um, political, may not jive with anyone else, but that doesn't make you not a Satanist. So, 
you know, oh. as long as you're contained within yourself and following the core philosophies, you know, as, as a life choice, then I, I, I call that Satanism. I don't think a sociopath is capable of being a Satanist. No. Similarly, someone with body dysmorphia disorder, I don't think they're capable of being a Satanist. That's again, interesting. Well, because they're, they look at their body and they don't see it for what it is. They only see something wrong with it. They become dependent on an idealized self. And everybody does this. Everybody looks in the mirror and they don't see the way they really are. Um, yeah, yeah. They, they see either a Superman or they see someone far weaker. And it's gray areas between those two extremes. But um, which is fine. It's like everybody's a little bit OCD. Everybody has their little thing. Everybody gets depressed. Um, but body dysmorphia. And maybe that's an unfair statement because until very recently, transgenderism fell under body dysmorphia. Actually, it still is considered body dysmorphia. Trans, uh, transgenderism is considered a personality disorder cured through gender uh, gender reassignment surgery. But uh, That's weird. Eh, I don't think so. To me, that makes cured sense. Cured through gender reassignment. Well, what are you going to do? Change their brain? <laughs> well, well, no. What I mean, what I'm saying is that the only way that you can be seen as a rational thinking individual, if you see yourself as a transsexual, a pre-op, is by going through that operation, and then suddenly you're cured. Like that's weird to me. Like, why can't you just be normal anyway? And this is just a process for you. It, it, it's not a cure, you know. Well, it's a cure because it gets rid of the body dysmorphia. You are you're. The way you think of yourself, your personality now now matches your body. The only thing it doesn't match is your genetics, and genetics don't really mean much in your everyday life. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I have the debate with my friends all the time: is uh, genetic gender is that the true gender? And I'm like, that's a useless question. <laughs> it's a it's a useless fucking question. Gender shouldn't be thought of in those terms anymore. But <laughs> especially anymore, now that you can I, hop I would back say. Forth. Yeah, I mean, it's. It's a uh, overly sim- it's weird because we look at <clears throat> we look and I'm going to bring this into sort of the science creationist realm. You mm-hmm. know, scientists or science enthusiasts look at creationists and think of them as absolutely obscure and insane and sort of, you know, they look at the world as sort of a good bad, you know, two sides of a coin. Whereas scientists look at it much more broadly. Everything's, you know, scales of gray. Uh it's the same way with, uh, I would think, a, a lot of people with sexuality is that, you know, we, and I don't know how true it is, but it seems like traditionally throughout our history, we have seen it as sort of a boy-girl, and in reality, it's just scales of gray. Like, it's it's this, this range of, 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 of taste and of expression. And so it's always interesting to me because we like to, we like to nail down norms when it comes to sexuality or when it comes to men, especially when it comes to mental illness and, and you know, what is normal air quotes. We like to think of it as like two sides of the same coin, but in reality, just as you were saying, like Beethoven probably had some severe mental illness, if not one, many, but is that truly an illness when it drives him to be a more fulfilled human being and to have such a mark on our entire world, not only in the time that he existed, but in the time since like he lasted beyond. I mean, talk about immortality. I mean, he's lasted beyond his lifespan. To be fair, let's, let's bring this closer down to earth. Have you ever read a biography of Beethoven? You know what? No, I have not. The people who were around him didn't have very much good to say. The only good thing you could say about Beethoven was his brilliance. <laughs> it's like talking about Van Gogh. The man was fucking crazy. He was nuts, but brilliant painter. So whether these people lived happy lives, well, that depends on how you define the word. So it's, a, it's kind of a useless question, but... Will they be remembered? Absolutely. Is everybody with bipolar disorder or some kind of manic depressive or schizophrenic person going to be that? Absolutely not. Just like uh, when when you say sociopath, people think of this deranged serial killer. Most of the time, a sociopath will do pyramid schemes, or they lo- like to lie a lot. Um, ooh, sorry. Quick side note: the time I got to work with a psychologist and interview a sociopath, oh, that man was so charming. <laughs> I loved talking to him. He was brilliant 
and charming and so seductive. He wasn't, there was nothing physically wow about him, but the way he spoke to you, you were just like, you're a god. (laughs) (laughs) These people are like consummate witches and warlocks. And it's terrifying because the only reason they do it is because they think it's fun. They think it's funny. <laughs> Which makes them incredibly dangerous because there's yeah. they'll go they're, they're never it's like a drug addict never getting enough. They're constantly bored. They gotta keep going and going and going. And Satanism is about knowing yourself, knowing what you can do, and then doing it and respecting certain um, practical laws. Respecting the fact that this is what you have to do to live the life you want to. Yeah. A sociopath is incapable of doing that. Ah, the law, fuck it. I want to run over a kid. Hey, that'd be a good time. Let's do that shit. And when they get caught, they'll have some fun with it. So, uh, okay. So to confound it a little bit more, to confuse it a little bit more, what if you're a sociopath on medication and you're temporarily in control of it? So do we we think – what's that? You cannot be. Here's – Here's the thing. Um, I I hate, though I love law and order, I hate them for this. Personality disorders, it's a misleading term. Um, Most of psychology and psychiatry is about not identifying what's wrong with people, it's identifying human behavior. And normal is also a misleading term. Normal is just, it seems to be what most, how, how most people are, how most people react to something. And this is just a measuring stick for the extremes. A sociopath is an extreme. Um, What made someone murder in a fit of jealousy? That's an extreme. But we need, in order to identify those extremes, we have to identify a common base. And um, personality disorders is just identifying certain kind of personalities that are incredibly dysfunctional. They have barriers that no one should. It's kind of like everybody has a fear, but do you have a phobia? Hmm. Like, I'm not just afraid of flying, I am, or I'm not just afraid of elevators. I get physically ill, and dr- I have to be dragged off an elevator, or dragged into one, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, there's a difference between being a little bit nervous on an elevator and having to drag me into one against my will. So, yeah, there, there are certain personalities, personality disorders that I think would just make you incapable of being a Satanist, sociopathic being one of them because there's no medication for it. That's the way you are. And there's no helping you. There's nothing we can do about it except shoot you. (laughs) And if it were only that easy. (laughs) Well, every now and then there's usually a bill put up that says anybody that is diagnosed with sociopathy must be immediately imprisoned. Really? Every now and then it appears. Um, I've never heard of this. Now, if you're under 18, that's called antisocial personality disorder, Um, because by definition, anyone who is not legally an adult cannot be called a sociopath, because for some reason they cling to this idea that um, if we catch it early, we can treat you. No, you can't. Yeah. Every honest psychologist, every research article about it will say, no, Mm -mm. it's not going to work. They're only going to get worse and just pray that they don't get a taste for – anything related to people to identity identity theft or killing just pray that they don't because there's no stopping them after that especially since they tend to be incredibly intelligent people (laughs) that's wild oh i love sociopaths they're so much fun (laughs) (laughs) up until the point that you're at the end of their knife yeah oh no i'm the doctor (laughs) (laughs) um so i I mean it's pretty clear i mean you know one of the I think amazing traits of a Satanist is their awareness, their self-awareness. And it is, is incredibly well. And and it's a pretty good litmus test also to weed out pseudos from actual Satanists is, is whether or not they are uh, these wildly pretentious um, self-centered individuals that have no sense of perspective or, or control over their own lives. I mean, it's, it's one thing to talk the talk, but when you see their lives spiraling into, uh, just destruction, you can pretty safely say, well, they have no control. Hence, they know nothing about lesser magic. Hence, they know nothing about themselves and hence they are not Satanists. I mean, it, it, it all kind of builds up in my opinion. You know, you, if you have a sense of yourself, then that means that you 
kind of have to have some semblance of a sense of perception. And if you have a sense of perception, then you have to be able to, in some manner, utilize lesser magic, in which case you are not going to be at the bottom of the barrel. And that's just kind of how I see it. The best example I can give of this, and though it's, um, I guess, somewhat tenuous, is uh, <laughs> somewhat tenuous. Anyway, um, there's, there's a COS member that I'm friends with named Robert, and uh, he's... Can I call him Roberto? You can. <laughs> I'm sure he'd appreciate that. <laughs> um, he has palsy, and he knows his limitations. He knows what he can and cannot do. And he laughs at his condition. And I have the utmost respect for that. And he is a total Satanist. Um, or, you know, he, he is a Satanist. And he has his physical ailments, but that does not stop him. So if you have, let's say, bipolar disorder, you know what you have. You know that it's not good for you. And you seek appropriate treatment. And you live the best life you can, knowing the fact that you have this handicap that you can do absolutely nothing about. It's not your fault. No one gave it to you. Shit happens. Boo hoo. But you deal with it the best way you can. And you make the best life that you possibly can closest to the ideal one that you want. Then why not? You mm -hmm. fit, as long as you can uphold the philosophy, live by its principles, and you're being the best goddamn crazy deity you can be, why not? Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, the only mental disorders I would say that are that would inhibit someone from being a Satanist is anything that um, necessitates a, a chemical dependency, some kind of body dysmorphia, sociopathy, uh, and things of that nature. Anything that would cause you from being incapable of being self-aware or anything that mis uh, means you are dependent upon something else outside of what all human beings are dependent on, you know, like love and affection, touching sex, things like that. Um, I don't, I don't see a problem with that, um, especially neurological disorders. Uh, neurological disorders, no one can help that. Schizophrenia is treatable depending on how severe it is. But, well, no, even if it's severe, it's treatable. The worst case scenario is you'll have to be ho hospitalized because you need to be closely watched. But even then, I, I would say that those are the only types of schizophrenics that are incapable of being a Satanist, even if they were born one. Yeah. Uh, they're well, incapable of it. I mean, this is kind of a, and, and by way of closing down the discussion, mm -hmm. uh, a bit of a loaded question because I, I kind of, he's rhetorical, I already know the answer. Um, <clears throat> do you think that someone who is incapable of expressing, physically expressing themselves and is just sort of trapped in their own mind, uh, physical or mental condition uh, being the, the, stimul uh, the, the cause for this, are they able to be a Satanist if they are just trapped inside themselves and unable to communicate to the outside world? kind of a duh <laughs> <laughs> there it is all right <laughs> well i i think that was a, an amazing question because there was so much wrapped inside of it and and it, it really comes down to a very simple uh understanding of what satanism really is and and at its very core, I think awareness is a, a pretty strong watchword for it. So thank you very much for the question, everyone. Uh, I appreciate it. If you want to send in your questions, shoot them off to info at 9centspodcast.com and we will address them during the show. I really appreciate everyone's uh, back and forth on this. And Den, amazing job. How about we do a little bit of Agent Provocateur? Well, I have one thing to say about the question, which is the, th the thing I like about these questions is it instead of... Focusing on the answer, it makes you focus on what constitute a Satanist. It makes you take a good hard look at the philosophy and understand how that applies to an individual. What personality traits make a Satanist that we all have in common, and there are a few. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say that. I love questions like that. Hell yeah. All so right. on to Darren. Oh, dude, this is a good one. All right, here we go. All right. I am not a liberal nor a conservative. I am not a Democrat, nor a Republican. I am not a Socialist, nor a Capitalist. I am not an Authoritarian, and I'm definitely not fighting for your cause. I belong to no party, I support no politicians, I am loyal to no state, and your cause celebra means nothing to me. I am Darren Deicide, Agent Provocateur. Welcome back to Agent Provocateur. I am your lovely and dashing host, Darren Deicide. 
Lately, we have been dealing with some pretty heavy topics, like the effects of the opium trade on the war in Afghanistan, or the impending crisis in Crimea. I like to deal with only the most pressing matters of our times, the ones that demand immediate attention. Because sometimes, there aren't issues that can wait. No, they're knocking right at your back door, and you have to deal with them immediately. Of course, you know, I'm talking about shit. Are you like me? Do you listen to Nine Cents when you take your morning shit? I have this sneaking suspicion that a great deal of you are meditating at the porcelain altar right now. I certainly am. Seriously, I'm recording from the Grand Throne as we speak. I listen to Nine Cents so often when I shit that when I'm not shitting and it comes on, I suddenly feel the need to shit. I think something of a garbage-in, garbage-out process is happening for me. Usually it's the traditional morning poop, which is quite a glorious shit. It is the morning poop that can often set the tone for your entire day. For me, it is like a daily oracle. If my morning poop is long and arduous, I brace myself for a day of intense challenges. If it slides out without any effort, I glide with ease through my day with the grace and witty nonchalance of Bill Murray in Ghostbusters. The morning poop has also taught me some highly specialized skills. For example, isn't it challenging to shit and smoke a cigarette? It's like balancing multiple spinning plates on little wooden poles. And if you fuck up, you may just burn your genitals with ash from your cigarette. Don't forget to tuck and lift before ashing in between your legs. Now. Did you know that a human being's first poop is called a meconium? It's true. I'm here to help you learn, folks. This first shit consists of intestinal cells, bile, mucus, water, and amniotic fluid. Since a baby hasn't eaten yet, these are the only things in a baby's system making it the most unique shit you will take in your life. It is sterile, odorless, and viscous, like tar. You might take one or two of these before actual digested nutrients from ingestion pass through your system, usually from breast milk. One theory suggests that the term meconium comes from Aristotle, who coined the term meconium arion, which is Greek for opium-like. He supposedly thought this shit induced sleep in the fetus. If ever a case has been made for philosophers having too much time on their hands, this could very well be the strongest evidence. Now, Dr. Robert A. Friedrich Jr. estimates in his book Nanomedicine that the average American flushes 0.22 to 0.44 pounds of shit every day. That means that America produces as much as 950,040,000 pounds of shit a day. It's true. We are full of shit and lots of it. And we may still be living up to our necks in shit, if not for Joseph Bazalgette the engineer who designed the first sewage system in response to the Great Stink of 1858. There is no punchline here. This actually happened. Prior to this invention, people in London simply dumped their shit in the Thames River. Well, eventually the Thames River became the Someone Light a Flame River. It was a particularly hot summer, so you can only imagine just how funky things got. You don't call something the Great Stink unless it earns it. Cholera broke out as London literally got covered in shit. Thank you, Joseph Bazalget. Speaking of sewage, did you ever wonder where shit goes once you flush it down the toilet? Well, if you're a good American, you don't think about that shit. Hell no! You don't think about where anything comes from or where the fuck it's going. No, no, clearly all that matters is consuming things. Everything else is bullshit. But since I got your feeble-minded attention, America, I'm going to tell you. Everything that goes down into the sewer turns into a delicious potpourri of every piece of human waste that goes down all your drains to form sewage. Eventually, this stew of shit makes its way to a treatment plant, which has pumps that collect all the sewage. Once there, the goal is to remove contaminants that would be exceptionally toxic. You know, like that Thanksgiving shit you took after eating grandma's butterball turkey? Waterborne bacteria are actually used to break down organic materials. The remainder is chemically or physically disinfected. What remains from this process, well, 
we just sort of dump it back into a body of water. Nice! We have streamlined our shitting on the planet. This isn't accounting for the amount of untreated, and I use this term suspiciously, pure shit that we dump right into the waters when no one is looking. You lake swimmers that stand stoically in the water when no one is around, we know what you're up to. And hey, statistics point to an approximate 90% of the developing world sewage being dumped into bodies of water untreated. These people are shitting on everything! In fact, we are so good at shitting all over everything that has pretty much taken over our water supply. In just about all the water supply here and abroad, there is evidence of fecal contamination. E. coli is usually the first indication. At this point, E. coli is viewed by most to be a rather benign bacteria, but most acknowledge that it isn't good for you and may lead to other bacterial presences that are dangerous. But, since it poses no immediate threat, there is an acceptable amount of E. coli that treatment plants allow in the water supply. Yes, Sherlock, your conclusion is correct. There is a little shit even in your drinking water. And hey, while we're talking about shit and what you drink, did you know that recently the patent for Monsanto's creation aspartame has been made public and that it confirms that it is made with the waste products of E. coli bacteria? The shit of shit is making shit that we put in shit. There's a little tongue twister for your Diet Coke drinkers to chew on. Well, isn't that a pleasant thought while you pinch yourself another stink loaf? While you take the kids out to the pool, Perhaps it is coming into perspective that we are caught in an unending cycle of shit begetting shit. We are like shit machines set to on and without any way to control or slow down. We are the Earth's Frankenstein with a severe diarrhea problem. I'm going to guess at this point that you're nearing the end of your shit. Hey, when you wipe, do you take a look at what you got? I do. How else are you going to know if you've done a good job? So go ahead. Do a good job and finish this poop off. Me? I'm off to read the AP wire on the internet. Maybe kill a minute or two on RateMyPoo.com. And then I'm hitting the daily grind. Hope your day runs smoothly. Thank you for listening. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Hey, if you're interested in more shit, go to Facebook.com slash Agent Provocateur on 9 cents, where I post shit about the shit happening all over the world. Whether it's a little shit, like the shit we've discussed today, or the bigger shit in the world. Take care. Militant eroticism. I'm a den or den. <laughs> we do not deal with the universe in any way except through our mind, colored with emotions and mental objects. 
the physical world seems to be quite meaningless to man beyond admitting that it is there, separate from us, and that we must work with it. The basic idea of human beings only being able to interact with the world subjectively and interpreting raw information through the senses in order to perceive such things as we perceive them carries to sexuality the following. Beyond what our evolution forces us to be attracted to, there is nothing you find physically attractive about the people you find physically attractive. You could say that's just postmodern bullshit philosophy, but I thought that I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> but think about the the phrase physically attractive. I like the legs. Well, no, it's not the legs that you like. But I want you to think about the attributes that turn you on. Soft hair, soft skin, green eyes, strong legs, beards, perhaps a particular aesthetic, like a punk rock Tinkerbell. Some things can be traced to our sexual evolution, like full lips and wide hips being connected to better childbearing or fertility. Wide shoulders, strong chins or a chiseled face, past the gloom, connected to testosterone and alpha <laughs> behavior. These things are easily explained through nature's signs of good reproduction. Other things that I mentioned a moment ago have almost nothing to do with biological indication of good reproduction. So why then do we find ourselves attracted to them? My personal opinion is a rather obvious one. And it's been said to me in the past, I don't, um, well, I, you meaning me, don't discuss anything that people don't already know. My answer to this very fair criticism is that I want people to confront themselves bluntly and brutally. With that, my answer is that we're an animal that interacts with the world and thinks through its imagination. These attributes mean something to you. They are an idea. I think that far more often than not, people are attracted to things that just don't exist. Fetishes have no physical basis in sex. S&M is sometimes thought to be appealing because of the close relationship pain and pleasure have physically. And though that's true, I disagree. And that's the reason why people get into it. It is the ideas and associations in that practice that are the thrill, not the physical sensation. Pressure on the prostate feels good for men. And I don't give a shit what they tell me. It is. It's a physiological fact. If I put pressure on your prostate, I can get you to come in under two minutes. It's going to happen. Whether you like anal sex or not, whether you're a faggot or not, it's going to happen. But you don't have to go through the anus to do it. And you also don't have to go nine inches in. You just have to, like, up to your knuckles, man. Just, no, no, not up to your <laughs> knuckles. No, not knuckles. That joint between, you know, the fingernail and the knuckle, whatever it is. You don't have to go that deep. <laughs> You just have to, it's like a pussy. You just got to put a finger <laughs> in, reach around the curve, and play Morris Code. Very, very lightly. <laughs> very lightly. There's a, there's a little spot, for, for the women out there, there's a little spot underneath the testicles on the taint where if you oh so lightly play Morris Code, you're going to hit the prostate. So, ladies, next time you're in bed with a man and you want to play with his prostate, and he's like, man, I'm not a faggot. Don't go up my ass. Just, you know. Go under the balls and just play with the prostate. Get a sex manual. It's in there. Look it up. Have some fun with your husband when he's been a particular asshole to you. Because it'll be really funny when he leaks prostate fluid from his ass. And he, he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. That's really hilarious. I came out my ass. Anyway. So back to when you listen to people describe their sexual fantasies, things that get them really hot and bothered and how they describe how things feel to them, they speak in almost archetypes. Sexuality to me is far more Jungian than anything else. Why do you like blondes? What ideas pop in your head when you see someone with soft blonde hair? What about dark skin? What about that midnight blue gets you going? What associations do you have with it? For me, personally, my ancestors were incredibly racist and I've been a very bad man and I need to be punished for it. <laughs> On the other hand, it seems black is associated with brutish animal alpha behavior. 
black men are just put in that category of brutal, monstrous, dominant, rapey sons of bitches. And God knows that reputation serves the motherfucking shit for them. I'm jealous. Well, not me, of course, because I like black guys and I'm getting the best end of the deal. But, you know, whatever. (laughs) What is it about a man sprawled in a bed with briefs, glasses on, and a book that is so damn tempting? What is it about that little geek with a nice body laying in bed that gets you going? What is it about tattoos? A man with rough and tough hands. A woman with soft legs. What is it about being spanked, tying someone up? verbally uh, humiliating or being verbally humiliated what is it about beards all these things are attractive because of the way you perceive them the reason i'm discussing this obvious truth is because when you sit down and you confront the reality of how you work you learn more about other people and you can exploit it you can manipulate other sexual desires and fantasies and even explore your your own to a far more satisfying depth Tracing the ideas associated with what you find attractive is the low road to self-discovery. And as I tell all the men that I bring home, it's just fun down here. (laughs) They say the biggest sexual organ is the brain. And this is exactly what I'm saying here. Reality is not what drives human sexuality. We do not have sex to procreate. Next to no social animal does. They do it for pleasure. Reproduction is just a positive side effect of it. We fuck for fun. But it's our perception of it, of human sexuality, our reimagining of human sexuality. Sexual fantasies seem to be exactly what Freud said about dreams. Sexual activity, in the way I'm talking here, seems to be a big satanic ritual. What you're doing has no effect on reality. Lighting the candle doesn't mean a goddamn thing. But the feelings, your perception of what you're doing, that's what changes the world around you, and that's what gets you your goals. The fantasy. We're obsessed with things that don't exist. We deal with reality through imagination. The universe is different than our perception of it. For example, we don't, um, what don't we perceive that actually exists? (laughs) X-rays. Not X-rays, gamma rays. Whatever. We can't see atoms, but they're there. Ah, silly example, but it works. (laughs) (laughs) The universe is different than our perception of it. What we perceive to be useful, I'm sorry, what we perceive is useful to our species' survival, and that is why we perceive it as such. Apply this to sexuality. Apply to fucking what we know about how human beings deal with reality, and perhaps you'll find some usefulness in the statement that fantasy precedes reality. And I'll end this with a quote from Blanche Barton in her welcome statement that I've always liked. I reread it frequently. We are a world of storytellers. If aliens really were studying our various cultures on this planet, they might be quite perplexed about our obsession with fiction. We read novels, we go to movies, we watch fictions on television, we carve them on walls for centuries. Even our history is filtered through dramatic storylines. Why? We use stories about our heroes, our gods, our demons, our successes, failures, dreams, and nightmares in order to preserve what has happened, to communicate our common values, to work through our common fears, to ritualize, instruct, and have fun. And always remember, keep your skirts up, your pants down, and no matter who bends over, what does it mean? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good job, man. That was a thing. Oh man, I, I've uh, there's so much in that I want to talk about. I wish I wish I had another hour to fucking do this show in. I'm um, sure you said it's your wife all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had another hour. No, what yeah. I say to my wife is, I wish I had just a couple more minutes, honey. <laughs> I totally would. <laughs> I got After it. you just come, honey, I know you didn't come, but damn, if I had another hour, <laughs> the kids are going to get up. And... <laughs> okay, totally unrelated. I mean, related to what you were saying, but unrelated to your segment. I have to say, ownership of one's orgasm is essential. I, I, I just want to say that. For a man to say. <laughs> no, I, and I say that from, you know, being in a relationship for so many years. It's, you know, you do what you can, you do everything you can to, I, okay, so, you know, very wildly personal about me, 
uh, I don't like to come first. And so I do everything I can to ensure that once my partner is finished, then I can finish. And so I, I don't like to come first. There's a guilt associated with it for me. So I go out of my way to do everything I can to make sure. And, and there gets to a point where in any relationship, you have to say, you, you got to tell me. You, you got to tell me what you're into at this moment because it's not the same from day to day and it's not the same from encounter to encounter. You, there, and this plays into the idea of fetishes. I mean, sometimes maybe you like me to fuck you in the ass and sometimes it's, you don't want me near it. Some, sometimes you're obsessing just about me squeezing the shit out of your nipple. And just a little fetishes from time to time that sort of crop up in our relationship. I just need you to fucking vocalize that so that I know what you want so I can help you get to where you want to get to. And we, we like to think of, at least maybe traditionally or stereotypically, we like to think of sexual encounters as this sort of union of two people. And what I like to think of it as uh, each partner getting their own. <laughs> like, to think that two people can agree on one specific outcome in any circumstance in my opinion, is asinine. So, you know, I may want that little taint massage or maybe a digit slipped as you were talking to, to earlier. <laughs> and, you know, maybe she really just wants me to fucking DJ that clit for a while. You know, whatever it is, I need you to fucking Wait, tell me so DJ we can make sure... Clip? What's that? Did you just say DJ... <laughs> waka, waka, waka. <laughs> God... Damn, you are such a nerd, Adam. <laughs> like, you are a fucking nerd. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Yo, man, I'm totally gonna DJ that clip. That's, that's exactly what I tell her. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, baby! Oh, Yo! You're as bad as my, what, my fucking fuck buddy, Vashon. He's like, I'm gonna eat that cake. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck did you say to me? <laughs> Eat that, dude! It's a, it's an anus. And I'm gonna say, eat that hole. I'm gonna eat that hole that one guy said to me. I'm gonna eat that brown eye. I'm like, oh no, you're not, because that shit ain't brown. Fuck. <laughs> and if you want it brown, you are looking at the wrong butthole. <laughs> <laughs> what? Fuck no. I have no idea where we are right now. <laughs> Me neither, but that's not the point here. The point is, DJ that clit. <laughs> tell, me, <laughs> tell me she laughs at you. Okay, please. I you never know, ask her. Never <laughs> tell that to her. That's just something I use as reference li- <laughs> externally. No, 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 no. You can't say that shit to me. No, it's straight up true. Bring it up. <laughs> In the heat, I'm. I would like to think. That others think of me, and I know for a fact that I am much smoother than that in the moment. I do not ever, nor have I ever, said, Hey, baby, let me DJ that shit for you. Like, <laughs> that don't happen. That's never happened. <laughs> if a guy said that to me, I'd fuck him just because it'd be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> It's like really bad pickup lines. I can't resist a, a guy who has no idea what he's doing and <laughs> or picking up. The fact that he had the ball to come up to someone like me, because, you know, I'm incredibly good looking. Mm-hmm. But anyway, someone who comes up to me and says something that cheesy, <laughs> dude, I'm going to fuck you out of some kind of respect. Like, you have the balls <laughs> to say something that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo! Oh god damn. <laughs> anyway, so no, alright. What what do you have about this? this I don't <laughs> this fucking know anymore. Hold on, I gotta <laughs> I kind of rein yeah. myself in. Um Okay, so I I I love this because it it plays off of this this familiar notion that we all share is in, you know, what is the norm of sexuality? What, you know, whether it's norm for us individually or not, we can recognize what society says is the norm of sexuality. And then we look at, you know, and, and at times deny or are completely unaware of these fetishes that we outside of the norm want and at times need so goddamn desperately bad. It makes no rational sense why we should want these 
these weird experiences or moments or sensations. But for whatever reason, we, we genuinely do need them. And I think it, it speaks to our, our, our human experience in, in much <clears throat> more of a crystal way than anything else in society uh, has, has tried to explain. Because, you know, we, we, we see our world and we say, okay, well, <clears throat> this is what it means to be a human being. This is what it means to be a productive member of society. This is what it means to be a good human being, uh, individual sense of self but then the, underneath that man underneath that blanket of normalcy is this this funk <laughs> that i'm gonna call <laughs> fetish i like that this funk yeah i have to steal that from you you can't fucking deny like it is so core to who you are that you may not even be aware of it at all until you see it or experience it and then you cannot get enough of it and so by way of clarification by way of explanation um there's a really great uh seemingly little known film that rob zombie made uh there was a cartoon oh that... <laughs> i know what you're talking about okay. so i showed this to a couple because i thought it would be it, well first of all i thought it was funny it was just genuinely i think a, a hilarious cartoon what was it el zombio or yeah el, uh, el super bisto or something like that yeah, yeah, that's it. All right. So All right, I showed ahead. this to a couple, and they, never having thought about it before, realized that they were hugely into animation porn. Like, that was <laughs> the gateway to them experiencing a whole new fetish that they had no idea that they ever connected with. But as a couple, they did intimately connect with it. So it's outside of our realm of human understanding, uh, proper... Uh, conceptual acceptance but fetishes they speak to who we are as an individual so much more intimately than anything else it's i mean it's so powerful oh uh, yeah ayn rand said once that art is the physical representation of well she didn't say the human soul but i'm going to it's the physical representation of the human soul it's our, it's us imprinting our will and art, meaning even architecture. Yeah. Um, it's us imprinting ourselves on the physical world in order to stand in awe of ourselves. It's complete egoism. When I walk through my, ask anybody who's at my birthday party, it was only a few days after I finished remodeling my apartment and I did it as much as I could by myself in order to prove to my ex, because he would, he loved to say, you know, you, you couldn't do any of this without me. I'm like, sure, I'll what show you, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fucking show you. So, you know, I had I had two fuck buddies help me, but only minimally. I would only let me do so much. And at my birthday party, when I had filled my house with my closest friends and people that I love or people that I respect, and I walked through it, I was like, this is me. I did this. This is great. Look at me all over the walls and the furniture on the statues and the pictures, everything. It's all me. It's complete egoism. And you can say the same thing about fetishes. You walk into, let's say you're in S&M because it's the easiest example. You walk into someone's dungeon, you'll get a good understanding of that personality. People really underestimate all you have to, uh, how People like to say everybody's trying to hide themselves. No one wants to be them. No, everybody is. Everybody's really trying to be them. But they're just telling it to you. If you shut your mouth and listen, everyone's going to tell you exactly what they want and who they are. Or just walk around their house and you'll get the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's absolutely amazing that... Everybody thinks everybody else is a mystery, and yet we can't help but project our ego, project ourselves onto everything we do, the best that we can, um, or at least what we'd like to think of as ourselves. Because even then, if you only get the projection of ego, you'll still get an idea of everything that they aspire to be, and all you have to do is downgrade it a few steps, and you'll get who they are, or at least their wishes. And really, the goal of all this is exploitation. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> but it's it, the, the point the point I'm making is we're a species 
that does not deal with reality. And this is not a bad yeah. thing. And and the reason I, I wrote this, because I put it up for a vote what, out of three essays, what everybody wanted to hear, this is what they chose. And the reason I wrote this one is because I see or I hear or I read um, Satan say people don't deal with reality enough. You know, they're trying to whitewash nature. And yeah, that, I get what they're saying. That's true. But that's not you do too. Look, look at us. <laughs> we um, we read books and we invest so much into characters that have never existed. We are, it's all of our religion, total environments. We try to live in a fantasy world. We interact with um, a mythology that we admit, we readily admit, has absolutely no bearing on reality. We play with our minds. We induce uh, what can be called natural hallucinations, like what Nemo said with um, in the ritual chamber with that essay, Who's There? You'll see things. Yeah, yeah. You'll hear things. But when you walk out of the room, recognize the fact that those things were completely in your head. This is all a part of it. It's We are fantastic creatures that only engage in our imagination. When's the last time you walked outside and you looked at something objectively, truly objectively? I would almost say that human beings are incapable of doing it. Everything Shit, means something When's the something last time you us. looked in the mirror objectively? I mean, fuck. I know, right? <laughs> they, they, say, they used to say that human beings were special because we were the only animal who was aware of ourselves. And as soon as I read that in a textbook my first semester of college, I'm like, <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> we don't recognize ourselves. We recognize what we wish to be. We only deal in fantasy. Yeah. And one of my friends like to say, I respect anybody who deals with truth. And I'm like, you must not respect a goddamn person. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really fucking good point and, and incredibly you know, intimate to, to anyone who's a Satanist because we, we live in the realm of make-believe. We create our environments. We create our realities. And we like to say that we're playing off of you know, this sort of air quote, accepted reality that, that maybe, you know, no one accepts. But when you're living in a world full of other creatures who own and, and only recognize their own reality, there is no shared reality anymore. So if you, if you can't recognize yourself as the manufactured plastic made by the destitute hands of indigenous third world participants uh, that you are, I mean, are you really even a human being? I mean, we have to be able to recognize the absurdity of our own. And this is what I love. And I'm going to sort of turn this around a little bit really quickly, if I may. This is what I love about fetishes is because, you know, certainly a Satanist, but, uh, you know, otherwise as just general uh, self-aware human beings we like to think of ourselves in control, but then fetishes seemingly have no connection to what we feel like we should like or feel like we want to like. It just is. It, like, you can't control it. It's just, it, it sort of has this power over you that you can't help. That's what I love about this, this sensation of the fetish is that you are absolutely zero control over it. Uh, you know, and, and this can be played through to pedophiles who cannot be cured because it is just how they are turned on to sexual predators who just live off of the next uh, prey, their next rape or their next assault. And they just can't change their ways because that is just who and what they are. Rather than speaking to uh, this general discussion of, of mental illness, Fetishes are a mental illness that affect every single one of us, whether we're yeah. aware of it or not. They're called paraphilias. They are, cons well, I don't know about it anymore. I'm going to have to open up my DSM, but paraphilias are considered um, uh, mental disorders. Uh, sex, natural sex should only be, you know, it's funny. If you define normalcy by population, by, uh, by the average, by what most people do, Heterosexual oral sex is the norm. 
Not vaginal penetration either. That's the funny part. I buy that, yeah. Yeah, it's dick-to-mouth heterosexual sex. Um, <laughs> I'm a fan, gotta say. <laughs> Are you? I would have never thought. <laughs> Wait, so wait, so when you say you're a fan, you like getting face fucked or you like fucking face? <laughs> <laughs> Are you treat this as if I was in like a, 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 a senator fucking hearing or something? Uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> Do you? Because that doesn't apply for a senator. <laughs> anyway, so the, the reason I think this, this speaks especially to Satanists is I hear too many Satanists say, well, that's just my nature. But they mean that quite literally. Like, I can't help it. It's my nature. It's ingrained in me. It's genetic. Well, sure, if you're speaking about nature as in nurture and nature in that kind of conversation, you can't help the experiences you interact with when you're a kid, but you can as an adult. When you're an adult, especially when you're a Satanist, and LeVay, how many times he said, choose your influences, choose your environment, choose the people you interact with, choose the world you want to live in. And build it and live there. Mm -hmm. um, sure, yeah, you can't choose your early experiences, and that's probably where fetishes come from, is uh, you sexualize early experiences that meant something to you. And especially since, in my opinion, sex is all about dominance and submission. It's almost violent. I agree with feminists when they say all sex is violence. Um, but... But maybe that's just my fetish. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't see it that way at all. Ah, oh, well, how, do you like the idea of you dominating your wife, Adam? No, I, I, I got to be honest when I say that, you know, as I was saying before, we own our own orgasm. I, I think it's very much, a, for me, it's a partnership of, okay, I'm going to scratch your back and you're going to scratch mine. It's, it, it's what a not, capitalist. What's that? <laughs> I said, you're such a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's the thing, though. Like, I don't mind being dominated from time to time. Like, more than not, I'm the dominator, but I I don't mind a woman pushing me down by the shoulders and fucking strapping me on. You know what I mean? I mean... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that you have no investment in your wife when you're, like... Go when you're going at her, and then she just tosses you over and sits on your face and says, "Eat my pussy." You're telling me that idea does not turn you on in any way, shape, or form. No, I'm saying that that absolutely does. Yeah, just Thank you saying that. Tell maybe. me again that dominance and submission is not the heart of sex. Oh no, I'm sorry. I th I see, and I thought you meant one or the other. I didn't. I didn't think no, you meant both. This is war. Sex is war. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm down. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Strike and reverse. I gotta put that tattooed on my ass instead of right now on my ass. I have you know abandoned all hope you who enter here. But I'm <laughs> sex is war. Uh, on that note, how can <laughs> be, <laughs> how can people get a hold of you? How can they follow you online? Ah, just go to Militant Eroticism on Facebook, type it in, it'll, I'll pop up, or at least my uh, my dick sigil will. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I've been using that as uh, an advertisement, and it's gotten quite a few individuals to uh, click through. The dick sigil? Oh, yeah. Oh, God bless my dick sigil. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna hire someone to make that as, um, to somehow put that in a baphomet. To put it on my ritual Ooh. or on my altar. That would be badass, I already, dude. I know, right? I already have a big dick candle at the top of my <laughs> altar. So I worship penis. But now it needs to be above there with, with Baphomet. He needs to oh, be infused awesome. with the cock that came out of my head. <laughs> it's 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 only satanic to do that. I, I would I wouldn't be very satanic if I didn't put the penis out of my head with you know with 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 my God, you know, just... <laughs> I'm behind you a hundred percent. Are you? Cause I don't feel like goddamn thing. <laughs> oh, that's genetics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, people, that is going to do it for yet another nine cents. I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, as always, we would love to hear from you and believe it or not, correspondence is what fuels this beast. 
So, visit the website 9centspodcast.com and send your correspondence to info at 9centspodcast.com. Let us know of any suggestions, critiques, corrections, or general comments you might have. You can visit the Satanet, Facebook, Google+, Twitter, or MySpace page for 9 cents and get updated on weekly topics. And once in a while, I throw in a little extra how do you do, so uh, follow us. Download the show Monday nights via my RSS feed found at 9centspodcast.com. We're also on Last.fm, Stitcher, Spotify, and YouTube, so look for us there. So yeah, we're pretty much fucking everywhere online, so why aren't you following us? That's the real question. What's wrong with you? You can subscribe to 9 Cents via iTunes by searching 9 Cents, and don't forget to leave a rating and or comment. If you'd like to learn more about the Church of Satan, and let's be fair, why the fuck wouldn't you, visit (laughs) churchofsatan.com. The only place for Satanism online. And, again, the only way this podcast is going to continue is if you tell someone, is if you share it. So every time you share one of my updates, every time you share one of our affiliated uh, segment posts like Militant Eroticism, you are doing us a favor, just as we do you a favor every week by producing this damn show. So... Continue said favor and share nine cents with your friends, your enemies. Share it with your grandmama. Share it with mama. I think she's going to appreciate it. She lived through the depression. She's going to appreciate it. Let's build this podcast together. I'll spread the word. And once again, thank you for joining me. As always, I am your his host. I don't know why I do that. I, 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 can't, I don't know either. I it's, can't take you. I never took you seriously to begin with, but damn. It shouldn't <laughs> It shouldn't be taken seriously. It's so old. I don't know why I continue to do it, but I can't help it. I'm your host, Adam Campbell, being head. joined by... Aden Arden. The fantastic one-of-a-kind Aden Arden. And until next week, hail Satan! Hail Satan. Oh, God, can I say that really gay? <laughs> I think I've can. always wanted to hear a flamer say Hail Satan. Do it. All right, all right. You ready? Yeah. Hail Satan. Come on, Colorado. All right, fine. Hail Satan. <laughs> there it is. Ah. Nice. <laughs> Thank you.